today, I'm going to ask for a little bit of participation during the message, so be prepared, okay? Um, how was your year? Thinking about the pandemic and how it's changed life and wondering how you all are doing too. And I want to know if you're getting weary of this battle with COVID. Anybody weary? Yes, I am. Um, stress over a long battle. In military, they call it combat fatigue, and it's over prolonged exposure to stress. And here's some of the markers that I think might apply to us now. Anxiety, depression, fatigue. Depletion, exhaustion, hypervigilance, indecision, irritability, sleep disturbances, loss of comrades, feeling alone, survivor's guilt. This is an interesting one. Thousand, thousand yard stare. Three so just kind of zone out and stare a thousand yards out. Trauma. Repeated search for a rescuer. Repeated search for a rescuer. So I, I actually would like to know some things. I haven't been here in a while, and you don't know what I've been through. I don't know what you've been through. But if you would, if you're, if you're comfortable, if not, that's okay. Um, by show of hands, have, I would like to know how many of you have lost somebody to COVID. Could you raise your hand? Yeah. So I'm going to take a, just a short moment of silence to just acknowledge the loss and honor them. So if you can just bow your heads for just a moment of silence. Father, we thank you for these comrades that are now in your hands, in your arms. In Jesus' name, amen. And how many of you have had someone close to you that you thought would die from COVID and they actually made it through? Yeah, some of those. I had a brother who was in the hospital two months and on a ventilator three weeks and miraculously made it through, doing great. How many of you have had COVID and got through it? Wow, quite a few. Good for you. Got through it, obviously. You wouldn't be sitting here. Um, <laughs> how, many, how many of you are right now are worried about somebody dying of COVID that you know that's close to you? One, Anthony, Arnie, yeah. So, Father, we pray for them, too. We pray for those who are struggling right now, that you would just um, infuse them with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I know there are certainly some ben benefits that have come out of the pandemic. Um, some, have, some have told me business is booming, like those in real estate. Uh, some have enjoyed being at home more, more time with spouse and kids, and just slowing down making family a priority again. I know people have enjoyed the chance to work from home because I get to do laundry and walk the dog and you know get a few things done on the side. Um, for some, it's just as simple as I don't have to drive to work and I get an extra hour or more a day or save on gas money. I want to share with you, though, some, some uh, these are comments or the kind of things I hear from my clients lately this past year. And if you would, when I read one that you can identify with, just raise your hand. That's all, if you're comfortable. I used to be social, not so much anymore. I feel like it's changing my personality. It's robbed my joy around so many things I do in life. I feel more alone than ever. Everybody else has somebody, and I'm by myself at home alone. I never had a problem before, but now I drink too much, eat too much, smoke too much, something too much. I feel cheated out on my senior year, my prom, my graduation, the wedding I really wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, every time I go out, I feel like I have to be on guard. Stressful. This job is not what I signed up for. All the fun has been taken out of it. Or I'm losing my job. <laughs> Two hands back there, Arnie. That's an airline pilot. <laughs> I hear that a lot. I have some clients who are flight attendants and whatnot. I'm more irritable, on edge a lot. Bill would tell me yes, so sure. <laughs> my family gatherings are so complicated, trying to figure out who's vaccinated, who's not, and who's at risk. It's hardly worth getting together. I can't plan my schedule. One day the kids are in school, the next they are back at home, and I have to supervise. How am I supposed to work? And I never get a break. <laughs> Brandy's got six hands up. Um, okay. I feel anxious at work, being around people. I don't know my purpose anymore. I feel hopeless. What's the point? So I know we've had this debate about, like, whose fault is this? Whose fault is the whole COVID thing? Did it come from China? Who was that one person that mistakenly or maybe not or something happened that one through the actions of one person, this has spread all around the world to the entire continent, sending us into isolation, sometimes quarantine. And while the details are different, doesn't the storyline sound a little familiar? Back in the Garden of Eden, Eden took one bite of the apple, shared it with Adam. Whose fault? Was it Eve's because she took the first bite? Or was it Adam's because he didn't stop her and speak up? You know, the original instructions were only given to Adam and then he created Eve? Go read it, Genesis 3. <laughs> Not that I'm blaming anybody. <laughs> Peter says, Eve's fault, like you're saying. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they were... Sin entered the world through one man, bringing death to all, as it says in Romans. And then we are cast out, sent away into quarantine, out of the garden, and out of their normal life. Adam and Eve had to leave with only their fig leaves to cover themselves up. I actually have a whole closet full of fig leaves. Brown ones, white ones, blue ones, red ones, different, different kinds of fabric, fuzzy ones, cool ones. <laughs> All kinds. <laughs> Comfy ones. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> I have all kinds of fig leaves that I actually have loved in these, in these very places where fig leaves were originally a source of shame. We've become kind of proud of them sometimes, you know? Um, I've spent a lot of money on those fig leaves. We go around going, hey, I like your fig leaves. Pay attention to what brand of fig leaves we're wearing. We think some are cool and some are not. So when we quit pointing the finger and stop to reflect, haven't we all bit the apple? Like, have you ever known something was wrong, and you did it anyway? Is anybody not? <laughs> okay. And in doing so, have you also maybe not got someone to join you where you shouldn't have? And when caught, did you ever lie about it or get defensive or just avoid responsibility for your actions somehow? So in some ways, We've done a lot of the same things. So we find ourselves living in this pande pandemic where everything is tainted by COVID, just like everything is tainted by sin. We long to be back in the life as we knew it, like Adam and Eve longing for the garden. Last week, Peter's sermon talked about hope, and he said a few things that caught my attention. Hope is the distance between what you have and what you desire. Do we hope for the life back there? I'm wondering. Do we hope for the life back there, or do we hope for something forward? All hope involves waiting. Instead of hoping God will give it to us, we take it, Peter said. We try to do it for him. We fear the promise isn't true. Sometimes we refuse to let go of the past 
And so we wander around, like in the wilderness, complaining and griping, thinking we had it better back there. The words of David in Psalm 30, 13, 1 say this, How long, O Lord? How long, Lord? How long? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I can identify with that verse. I'm going to do in this next section a little, a little responsive kind of thing. And your, your line is just, how long, Lord? Okay, that's your line. So when I point to you, you go, how long, Lord? And I'm going to give a response, okay? Over a year, said Noah, when he, after he spent 40 days in the ark, and then time for the floods to subside. Two or three years, maybe, longer for Job's suffering. Twenty-two years for Joseph to see his brothers again after sold into slavery. Twenty-five years, said Abraham, as he had to wait for an heir. 38 years, the man paralyzed at the pool of Bethesda. 40 years, the children wandering in the wilderness. Three days from the time Jesus suffered on the cross and was risen again. And I'll bet it felt like an eternity. Sometimes I've wondered, is it an eternity? If God's outside of time and space and... He suffers with us continually as we suffer. Whatever your battle is, in addition to asking how long, I also ask why. Who caused it? What am I supposed to do about it? And how bad is this going to get? What battles are you fighting? Maybe it's with relationships. Maybe it's with finances. Maybe it's addiction or your health. Maybe it's fear, anxiety, depression. Maybe it's grief and loss. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's just, I want to get a good night's sleep. So this past year, I have felt very weary. And I'm going to share a bit of my personal battle with you that I have had. About a year ago, around this time, I started having some very strange physical symptoms. And the way I describe it is kind of like um, any clothes I tried to put on my skin felt like sandpaper. Like I had sand in my clothes. And across my back especially would burn. You know how, you know, you can tolerate sand in your clothes for a little while, but after a while it starts to burn and just like, oh, so aggravating. You can hardly stand it. Um, I actually said to Bill one time, you know, how long does it take for Chinese water torture to become torture? I looked it up, 20 hours, <laughs> okay? Uh, so I can handle like a low, little low grade of something for a little while, but if that's continual day in, day out. And so far I haven't found anywhere that I can't wear clothes, so um, <laughs> this is a real problem for me, okay? Um, some said that sounds like shingles, and so we checked all that out. And uh, I didn't have any rashes, nothing you could see, and, um, but things started to go to other parts of my body tingles, buzzing, vibrating, just weird, I don't know, I don't, like something got in there and just floating around. And so I started searching for answers. Dermatologist, chiropractor, general practitioner, three neurologists, chiropractor, acupuncture, physical therapy, yoga, which I'm currently loving right now, but all kinds of tests, blood work, Test my vitamin levels, autoimmune disorders, heavy metal tests. I had an MRI, I had an EMG, I had uh, that nerve test, and everything came back normal. Now, I know you all know I'm not normal, so <laughs> we, won't, we won't debate that part. But <laughs> my test came back normal. I was relieved, but it was still a mystery. I tried some antiviral meds in case there was some kind of, you know, apparently there's shingles that don't have rashes. Um, and then, you know, for a number of months here now taking pain meds, the doctors all said, we don't know. I had two doctors that said, well, their best guess is either some kind of virus that got in my system 
or some reaction to one of the vaccines. Shingles or COVID or both. I, I don't know. I still don't know. So I uh, realized, oh, I had one doctor finally say this. His diagnosis was small fiber neuropathy. Now, that's not a cause. That's just a description. It doesn't really tell me that much. So the emotional toll of this was huge. In the beginning, when I didn't know what was wrong, and I, was, and I still don't know what's wrong, I've, I've relaxed some, but I would wake up in the middle of the night, and that's when my fears would just be running wild with the worst. How bad is this going to get? What is it? What am I supposed to do? Ah, just spinning and spinning, and you know, wouldn't want to wake Bill up. But um, I'd question the worst. Is this MS? Is this guillain Bar? Is this paralysis? Is this, what's this leading to? Like, is this going to kill me? And then I had this thought, there's worse things than dying. Because there are days when I thought I would be just fine to die without that medication. Now that would scare Bill, and he's like, don't say that ever again. And you know, <laughs> I'm not suicidal, okay? I'm just telling you how dark it would get. And there were times when I would think to myself, you know, when people have died of COVID or died when not planned or died at a younger age than we wanted or expected, I thought, I wonder what God's saving them from. Maybe, maybe he's saving them from pain, Alzheimer's, cancer. I mean, who knows? Tragedy in life. Who knows? We don't know. I had one neurologist in Boston say two-thirds of his patients with this kind of stuff eventually work through it. And I thought, Two years sounds really good, because <laughs> I'm thinking I'm stuck with this for life. But I really don't know still. So sometimes I'm scared. Sometimes I have hope. Sometimes I have faith. Sometimes I distract myself by binging TV shows with Bill, like Yellowstone and 1883 and Suits. Those are all really good. You should try them. Uh, <laughs> And sometimes I struggle. The ironic thing is now, I go in my closet of fig leaves, and I don't go, oh, what can I wear today? I go, oh, what can I tolerate today? And here's this little section of clothes that I've bought, I'm wearing them now. <laughs> A few, I'll probably wear this every time at church, because that's all I got. <laughs> uh, because I, I can't wear what I used to wear. There are times when I thought, you know, maybe God is showing me, I've actually made an idol out of some of those clothes. I've made an idol out of that. Why have I spent so much money in it? You know, Scripture says where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Well, I can wear nylon and fleece, all right? So if you're thinking of buying something for me, nylon or fleece is good. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, your battle is personal to you, whether large or small. It's important. You know, I wish my battle were lighter, um, but I'm fully aware it could be a lot worse. And some people are really suffering through a lot worse. I read a Facebook quote that said, Be kind. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. We are in the middle of the story. So we're going to read a story from Scripture now, and it's out of Second Chronicles 20. And I'm actually going to read this out of the message, okay? And I want you to put your story in this story. Whatever, whatever it is that you're struggling with, dealing with, and hey, if you're in a good place with a lot of blessing, I'm like, enjoy it. Guilt-free, just enjoy it. This isn't meant to make you feel bad, um, but just enjoy that space, okay? So Second Chronicles 20. Sometime later, the Moabites and Ammonites, accompanied by Meunites, joined forces to make war on Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat received this intelligence reports, report. A huge force is on its way from beyond the Dead Sea to fight you. There's no time to waste. There's they are already at Haz Hazazon Tamar, the oasis of En Gedi. The news is coming. Doesn't this kind of remind you like two years ago when the pandemic, we heard about it over there in China, and we're like, they're like, it's coming your way. It's coming, and it's going to get you. You know that, that news, that, that phone call that 
that first alarm when there's a battle coming your way. You get that phone call with the lab results. Maybe you stumble onto a text and you realize your partner is having an affair. Maybe somebody passes away suddenly, unexpectedly. Maybe you get a call from school and your kid is the one smoking marijuana out back and they've been skipping every day. There's a battle coming your way and somewhere we get that first alarm. So the next sentence, shaken, Jehoshaphat prayed. He went to God for help. Shaken. I think that's a normal human response. It's okay to admit I'm shaken. It's okay to admit there's something bigger coming my way that I can face. What do I do? Where do I go? Where do I turn? Oftentimes, we'll turn to, I don't know, drinking, food, shopping, you know, whatever it might be. We'll turn to some kind of escape because we're shaken, looking for comfort. And here Jehoshaphat turned to God and prayed. A prayer, a prayer isn't like a magic pill. You like do this and you get something good back. It's a relationship. It's just a conversation with God. Like talk to him about it. You talk, you listen. It's a conversation. The next phrase, as Jehoshaphat continued, he ordered a nationwide fast. Fast? I haven't thought about that in a long time. Forget about it. Most people turn towards food, not away from food. Uh, mine happened to be chocolate and bread or anything along that line, crunchy things. Um, I, I will say I did, well, let's see. I fast between breakfast, lunch, and dinner, <laughs> if that counts. And I did try some intermittent fasting. You know, that's the one where you do all your eating in an eight-hour period, so then you're not eating the other 16 hours. But I will admit, there's, there was nothing spiritually motivating that fast. I just wanted to drop a few pounds. But sometimes God uses wrong motives to still achieve his purposes. The funny thing is, you know, I had this friend, Lisa, that I've been texting, and she had no idea I was giving this talk and no idea, you know, what it was about. Or, but I did share some of the struggles. And, and she texted me and said, have you fasted and prayed? And I'm like, no. <laughs> then uh, I'm thinking about it. And she said, have you had the elders anoint and pray over you? And I thought, no. So Peter, sometime here in the near future, I'll, Susan, I'll be coming your way. Whoever else, um, I need it. But what are the purposes of fasting? To develop a spiritual appetite and return to our first love. To connect to God's heart his perspective, his energy, his love, his power. To confess and repent of idols, things that we have turned to instead of him, whatever that is, or whoever that is. Being quiet and emptying ourselves, hearing his voice, his guidance, seeking wisdom to show us the way. What do you want me to do? and to worship. This verse in Isaiah 30 says this, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things, and you will say to them, Be gone. Maybe my clothes have been an idol. I've actually packed up several bags and given some away here and there. <laughs> well, I'll never wear that again. Uh, so, the, so back to the verses. Uh, the country of Judah united in seeking God's help. They came from all the cities of Judah to pray to God. We're united as we come here to church. That's partly why we come to church, is to come and, and to be united, including the people online. I, I've loved watching online and still feeling like I'm a part of the community and seeing you all here, even if it's the back of your head. 
United we stand, divided we fall. There's so much division in the world, and God wants to unite us. Do you have a community of your own where you can unite when you're going through a battle that'll, that'll join you? Who will, who will come alongside and undo the aloneness of your battle? We're meant for connection and relationship, but our battles tend to take us into isolation. So right now, we're going to take a moment to pray. We didn't spend a lot of time earlier praying. Um, but here's what I want to do. I want, I want to just take a little bit to pray. And I'd love for you to just out loud, if you're comfortable, name your battle. It might just be one word. I'm struggling, just the one word. could be one phrase. Um, if, if you also have a battle you, you're taking up for somebody else, Maybe, maybe you, there's someone else you want to lift up. It's their battle, and I'm, I'm uh, naming theirs. So we're just going to take a minute to bow our heads, so let's pray. Father, you know our battles, but now we want to talk to you about it. So we want to tell you what those are. Mm-hmm. Uncertainty at work. Feeling inadequate. Where do I belong? Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Then Jehoshaphat took a position before the assembled people of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of God in front of the new courtyard. And he said, O God, God of our ancestors, are you not God in heaven above and ruler of all kingdoms below? You hold all power and might in your fist. No one stands a chance against you. You know, sometimes uh, I just complain about the journey, you know, just keep whining about it, Bill here. <laughs> sometimes I just complain. But take a position, take a position, like write your position paper on this. What's your position paper? Uh, it means to like take a stand on what you believe. You could still have emotions that may or may not line up with that, but to take a stand and to share what you're basing it on. So I'm just going to have us all read together that one little part that starts with, oh God, that part. I'm just going to have us read that together as a way of together in unity, we're taking a stand, we're stating our position. You guys have that up there? Yeah, the very bottom, very bottom. Okay, here we go. Oh God, God of our ancestors, are you not God in heaven above and ruler of all kingdoms below? 
You hold all power and might in your fists. No one stands a chance against you. Not even myself. We call it sabotage. So as Jehoshaphat continued to pray, he said, And didn't you make the natives of this land leave as you brought your people Israel in, turning it over permanently to your people Israel, the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived here and built a holy house of worship to honor you, saying, When the worst happens, whether war or flood or disease or famine or whatever it is you're dealing with, and we take our place before this temple, we know you are personally present in this place and pray out of our pain and trouble. We know that you will listen and give victory. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and it is where God is personally present. And even if our outer man is decaying, the inner man is being renewed. You know what Jesus said when he said, I will tear, they'll tell, tear down this temple, and in three days I will, rise, I will rise up. Out of our pain and trouble, he is listening. What we have with God is a relationship. And how do we know that there's a victory? Well, I know in the moment it sure doesn't feel like it. But when Jesus conquered death, he conquered everything. He took on everything we possibly struggle with, every battle, and he conquered it when he rose again and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And that life lives inside of us. Next, and now it's happened. Men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir have shown up. You didn't let Israel touch them when we got here at first. We detoured around them and didn't lay a hand on them. And now they've come back to kick us out of the country you gave us. Oh, dear God, won't you take care of them? We're helpless before this vandal horde really ready to attack us. We don't know what to do. We're looking to you. You know, the step one of AA is to admit your powerlessness. And it's to admit, I don't know what to do. We come to that place of recognizing what I can't control. We tend to waste a lot of energy on what we can't control. Then we have none left for maybe the things that God might actually prompt us to do. So admitting what you can't control. The next phrase, everyone in Judah was there. Little children, wives, sons, all present and attentive to God. They were all huddled together, present and attentive to God. Like I picture comrades in a foxhole hiding out from the enemies. And when you're facing a battle, who's in your foxhole? Who's there with you in that place? Even children can be messengers of God. My granddaughter, uh, Kyle, she's four years old, um, I was playing with her at Christmas and just doing our thing. And out of the blue, she says, Franny, how's your back? <laughs> like, Where's that coming from? <laughs> and then um, I was like, well, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, gave a short answer. And then she says, I love you, Franny. And in that moment, it was like a little bit of a healing kind of salve. My friends have been there with me to listen, share, pray, share resources. My mom made me this outfit that is out of fleece and like pants and a top and it's inside out so the fleece can go towards the skin and I wear it lounging around the house. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous looking outfit, but I love it. <laughs> I look like the abominable uh, snow girl or something. Um, so, uh, but my mom, should, she would do anything and it's hard when moms see their kids struggling. Bill. He's the one that has been there day in and day out, times when I needed him to just put a hot washcloth on my back or hold me when I was in tears or watch binge, binge shows with me <laughs> when I'm just scared or tired and worn out from all this. There are people in our foxholes that are meant to undo the aloneness who enter into the suffering 
as a counselor that I'm now doing full-time, most of you know that, I had one client tell me, um, well, I don't want to talk to anyone about my addiction to pain meds unless they themselves have experienced chronic pain. It was just one of those little pieces of, I guess I'm in the right place to speak into someone's life. These people give me a taste of unconditional love. Did you know that love reduces stress on the body, increases feel-good dopamine, secure bonding hormones, oxytocin, mood stabilizer, serotonin? Do you know love can do that in your body? It's pretty cool. This next section. Then Jehaziel was moved by the Spirit of God to speak from the midst of the congregation. He said, Attention, everyone, all of you from out of town, all of you from Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, God's word, don't be afraid. Don't pay any mind to this vandal horde. This is God's war, not yours. Tomorrow you'll go after them. See, they're already on their way up the slopes of Ziz. You'll meet them at the end of the ravine near the wilderness of Jeruel. You won't have to lift a hand in this battle. Just stand firm. Judah and Jerusalem, and watch God's saving work for you take shape. Don't be afraid. Don't waver. March out boldly tomorrow. God is with you. So at this point, they don't know really what's going to happen. I mean, wouldn't you be thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so they don't have the end of the story. They're in the middle of the story, like a lot of us are in the middle of the story. God knows the end of the story because he sits outside of time. He's already at the end of the story. He knows what he's going to do. He knows this life. He knows where it can be hard, and he is with us. He's speaking from confidence, not what you can do, but what he can do. Don't pay any mind to the enemy. Stand firm and watch where God's at work. It's a very different posture to kind of watch where God's at work and be prompted and led rather than a frantic, uh, like me, I'm online, like maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and I'm reading everything and absorbing everything. And I'm like, you know, it's a very different energy. This is war is God's, not yours. And sometimes we need a miracle. And for, from God's perspective, the battle is already done. Next part. Then Jehoshaphat knelt down, bowing his face to the ground. All Judah and, his, and, and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping God. The Levites, both Kohathites and Korahites, stood to their feet to praise God the God of Israel. They praised at the top of their lungs. They were up early in the morning, ready to march into the wilderness of Tekoa. As they were leaving, Jehoshaphat stood up and said, Listen, Judah and Jerusalem, listen to what I have to say. Believe firmly in God, your God, and your lives will be firm. Believe in the prophets, and you'll come out on top. After taking, talking it over with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed a choir for God. Dressed in holy robes, they were to march ahead of the troops, singing, Give thanks to God. His love never quits. I thought, stand firm. I'm wobbly. But he is firm. When I stand with him, then I am firm. I picture like this little young plant growing, growing against a stick, you know. like <laughs> I'm, I'm all wobbly, and I need someone firm to keep me up. And then I read this part about the choir, and I'm like, seriously? Do you think President Biden is going to like, call the government of Ukraine and go, hey, we want to help you out. We're going to send about uh, 10,000 of our best choir members over <laughs> to, the, to the line border with Russia, and uh, it's going to be great. Just watch. <laughs> that would go over really well. Um, you know, it's funny, like I, like I said, the same friend who didn't know about the talk, she also texted me this. Are you putting on your praise music and jamming out to it? <laughs> and I, I thought, man, this is like, you know, when things are in sync, your work, your, something's on your mind, and then you hear it from other places. Um, I'm doing this online yoga. It's awesome. It's on YouTube, Yoga with Adrian. And 
you know, it's normally just yoga, but this particular day, I'm behind, but it's, it was the seventh day. And she was started singing her instructions. <laughs> and I'm like, why is she singing her instructions? And she kind of made a little joke out of it. Um, anyway, sometimes when I find myself out walking and, you know, I bet you've had this experience, like some song just starts popping out of your mouth or you start humming a tune. Well, I started humming this tune and I'm like, oh, what is that song? I, you know, it's really, really, really familiar. But I'm like, oh, that's how great thou art. That I was just started, it just started to come. So when you approach your, sing, your battle, sing. Did you know research, research has shown that singing can be good to lower stress, boost immunity, and improve your lung function, enhance your memory, improve mental health, help you cope with pain. So we're going to sing some more later. Um, but for now, I want to do this. I want to do what Jehoshaphat was doing. And whatever your struggle, I want to, he bowed before the Lord. So we're going to take a moment to just bow. You may just bow your head. You may lean on the chair in front of you. You might feel like knee, kneeling. But whatever it is, I want you to just bow your heads for a bit. And in bowing our heads, we're acknowledging that God is God and I am not. It's a position of humility. And as you think about your struggle, acknowledging what you can't control. that's bigger than you. Take a big deep breath, like you're just going to relax that control and let it go and release it. that God reigns over everything. He knows everything. He's not afraid. And he lives in us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So now you can lift your heads, and now you can stand up, okay? Now you can stand up, because we're going to sing the one phrase now. You probably, this was actually a very, very popular and common song, so I think you probably know the words, because it, it goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Sing praise. Amen. <laughs> Not a worship leader, but that was kind of fun. You can be seated. <laughs> um, <clears throat> sometimes when we sing, we get into it and we even laugh or things like that. It just it lightens us. Um, and you know, laughter also decreases your heart, relieves stress, soothes tension, helps your muscles relax. Um, so the next part of this, as soon as they started shouting and praising, God set amb ambush ambushes <laughs> against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir as they were attacking Judah, and they all ended up dead. The Ammonites and Moabites mistakenly attacked those from Mount Seir and massacred them. Then, further confused, they went at each other, and they all ended up killed. What a crazy story. Who 
who would have thought? Like when you're hearing, hey, God's got this, you know, something's going to happen here. And you're like, okay, how's that going to work? And you have no earthly way of thinking how this could happen. Uh, God had them all like kind of get confused and destroy themselves. As Judah came up over the rise, looking into the wilderness for the horde of barbarians, they looked on a field, killing field of dead bodies. Not a living soul was among them. The enemies were destroyed and God's people were left standing. The enemies are killed off, which is great news. I'd be shaking my head like, this is just unbelievable. Like, I can't believe this is how the circumstances happened and we just kind of walked in. It's great news, unless you're an Ammonite or a Moabite. That's another sermon, and if you want to dive into that, Peter has a great one, and it's called Picture on the Father's Desk. So if you want to really go into that, more time than what we have to go into, and Peter's way better at it. So um, do you wish your enemies dead? Maybe you've ever had that thought, God, I wish they just died. It'd be a lot easier. An ex, those Republicans, those Democrats, anybody who believes different than me. If we're honest, maybe sometimes we do wish that. But maybe what we're really saying was we wish parts of them were dead. Because we don't like certain parts of them. I've learned to kind of have a new lens when I look at Scripture. And the lens is when I look at roles and different, you know, characters in the story. And, you know, I usually put myself in the good guy role, you know. <laughs> so, but I rarely put myself in the bad guy role. Um, but one of the lenses I've, used, I've learned to do with Scripture is to take the story and all the, all the parts are in here. Like, I, I'm my own worst enemy. And there's a voice in there that says, I'm coming to get you. <clears throat> you're not good enough, you're inadequate, you can't do this, you're crazy, uh, this is all in your head. I have a enemy, an enemy that is inside. It's the naysayer, it's the inner critic, it's that voice of condemnation. It's the voice of the enemy, the enemy. And that's the part that God wants to kill off. And he is. He wants to kill off our pride, our ego, our selfishness, our false idols, our despair, our division. He wants to kill off our flesh, and he wants to kill off everybody else's flesh. And when the flesh is dead, all that remains standing is our true self. Next part. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to carry off the plunder, they found more loot than they could carry off. Equipment. Clothing, <laughs> fig leaves, valuables. It took three days to cart it away. On the fourth day, they came together at the Valley of Blessing and blessed God. That's how it got the name Valley of Blessing. Jehoshaphat then led all the men of Judah and Jerusalem back to Jerusalem. An exuberant parade. God had given them joyful relief of the, from their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and came to the temple of God with all the instruments of the band playing. When the surrounding kingdoms got word that God had fought Israel's enemies, the fear of God descended upon them. Jehoshaphat heard from, no, no more from them. As long as Jehoshaphat reigned, peace reigned. Blessings do come. The blessings are a gift, not what you've earned or achieved, but more about received along the way. And Jehoshaphat is kind of a picture of Jesus, an intercessor on our behalf. He talks to the one in command on our behalf. When he reigns, when he reigns, we have peace because we have him and he's the Prince of Peace. Blessings and peace bring gratitude, true gratitude. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle is against the lies of the enemy. Jesus sometimes is faith on my behalf because I go, I really don't have any, but he does, and I've got him. So I don't even have to muster that up. 
And the last line, that about sums up Jehoshaphat's reign over Judah. And that about sums up the message. So today, as we go to communion, I want you to bring your battles. He battled on the cross, and he took on our battles and suffered. But the cross was not the end of the story. The cross is empty, and he rose again, and he seated at the right hand of the Father, and that's where we are, seated in victory with him. We have the end of the story. And when we can sit in that place, meditate on that place, believe that place, um, enter into it, he gives us life. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body. And maybe you feel broken too. He said, take and eat it. And then he poured the cup. And he said... This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of all the ways you've tried to fight the battle in your own strength. And he said, drink of it. So we'll do communion starting in the back and can come forward to the sides here and take your uh, wine and bread back to your seat and do communion. When I was preparing this talk, I read this story about a Japanese soldier who um, was stationed in the Philippines. And this was World War II. And when the war was over, he didn't know it was over. So he and a few others stayed hiding in the jungle. But he stayed there the longest, 30 years. During this time, they dropped leaflets saying, hey, the war's over. He didn't believe it, thought it was fake news. And he wouldn't believe the war was over until his, his commanding officer flew down there to go find him and get him and um, declare to him that the war is over. So he wouldn't listen until his high, higher commanding officer would tell him the war is over. So God is telling us as our commanding officer, the war is over, okay? And I know we got to walk this life and it's hard and it struggles and he's with us. He is in front of us, he's behind us, he's beside us, and he's in us. Amen. If you would like prayer, I want to say this. Um, there are Ted's over here. I know Peter and Susan will be down front. This is a great Sunday. If you really would like to bring your battle and be prayed over, you know, there's some humility in doing that, and there's connection in doing that. And you know, uh, you may feel like, oh, I can do that on my own, or I got to go to lunch or something. But um, when the paralyzed man sat by the pool and someone came and said, do you want to be healed? And he's like, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe there's some healing that you need. And so they are here to pray, and I'm going to be first in line. So keep back off. <laughs> okay. Have a great day, you guys. <laughs> great to see you. <laughs>